Welcome at, back, everybody, for day two of the drill down. What I wish I knew then, 10 epic fundraising fails. I find it hard to believe that Jack Delato, the master trainer from Fundraising Academy at National uh, University, I added the word master trainer. Um, I, I can't imagine that you have ever failed. Oh, gosh. So many <laughs> times. I can't tell you. <laughs> so many times. I, could, I think that the book that I'm going to write is my fails. My <laughs> fundraising fails. You know, it, it you, so easy. I could probably do it in a day. <laughs> well, I just think of you as... I just don't even think of you as ever having personally experienced any of these, but I think that's what makes you genuine and really valuable. And I'm so delighted that we get to have this time with you. Another thing that's really exciting about the nonprofit show is that we have assembled a new group of co-hosts and I'm one of them, one of eight. They're super cool people from all over the country doing different things and it's really been fun to get to know them and meet them. And so you'll be seeing more and more of them um, on the nonprofit show. Very, very exciting. We also are extremely excited about this amazing sponsorship cadre that we have. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Okay, Jack Alato, CFRE, Master Guru of all things CFRE. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be back. I loved being on yesterday. I, think, I thought we had a wonderful discussion. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jack, I think one of the things that I learned from you early on, and now we've worked together for five years, even though we've never met IRL in real life, um, you only know me from the size of the screen. Um, I always feel that you are two things, very realistic and very forgiving. Like you, you know what's, what the problems are or where we can flounder, but then you have a lot of, to use the word grace, you have a lot of, um, get up, let's do it again, you know, and, and I don't know, do you practice that or do you see that in yourself? You know, not really, but I am so happy that I know you and that even though <laughs> we've never met in, in public, I, you know, I'm blushing right now. I can't tell you how red my face is, uh, but, but you know, the thing is, I think, uh, I, I think the wonderful thing about these two sessions we're doing is that if we don't fail, then how do we know to fix it? And I I think the thing that I've learned early on is that, uh, yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes and you cannot redo them. But I think going forward, the, the whole mantra for me is not to do the same thing again. In fundraising right. in life or whatever, you know, I mean, um, it's, uh, you know, it's really important. Well, it seems to me that if you can't look at it that way, and, and I'm speaking for myself because I've been a community fundraiser. I've never been fearful about asking for money for somebody else, not myself mm -hmm. and my own business, but you know, as a community person. Um, and then I'll be like, well, what the hell? Why didn't that work? Yeah. Right? <laughs> and then, yeah. Or like, oh, yeah. well, I'm a rock star. They gave money, right? Yeah. And so it's it turns into something that's not intellectualized. It's more emotional. It's a win yeah. or a loss. Yeah. Right? And that's what I like about this two-day drill down is that it's really helping us to understand actually what went on. It's yeah. not just the win or the loss. It's like kind of what the, the longer term thing is. So let's get into it. We had five yesterday. We're going to have another five Great. today. And you say fundraising fail, which is kind of an interesting thing that I really want to spend some time in is not tailoring your presentation yeah. to your donor. Right. And I'm I, thinking yeah, yeah. it's all one size fits all, but you're saying no, it's, it's not. You know, I mean, I, you know, I was involved one. I'll give you a real life example. This really happened to me in my career. You know, I was involved in a capital campaign and we had this 
transformational donor, gave us $100,000 a year. And he just loved the work of the organization. And we we were uh, remodeling a building and I knew the guy, I, I, had, I knew his wife, I knew his children, I've been to his house and I was gonna present to him a, I was gonna ask him for a million dollars to help us remodel this building. And I went to lunch with him, Julia, and I sat down with him and I went through all of the wonderful things that this new building would be doing. It was a social service organization, you know, anti-gang violence, alleviating homelessness, a whole bunch of things. And at the very end, I said to him, you know, I really want to ask you for a million dollars. And if I would like to present as part of this, this was my presentation, as part of this, I want to name some part of the building after you and Mrs. So-and-so, okay? The guy sat back and said, oh, no, 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 no. We do not want our name on anything. And that was a failure at not understanding what the motivations were for that donor and then tailoring my presentation for that specific donor. Yeah. Now, as it turned out, we got the million dollars, but I was shocked. And this happened many, many years ago. And I still remember it today because I made the, fate, not a fatal mistake, but I made the mistake of not understanding that guy's motivations. We talked about motivations yesterday. Yesterday. Mm -hmm. And when you know their motivations and his motivation was not to have a name somewhere, it was something entirely different. You know what I said to him? I said, what do you, if, if you gave a million dollars, what would you want mm -hmm. to do? And you know what he said? My wife and I, we want to stand with poor people. What a beautiful thing. I learned, first of all, the guy to me, when I think of what a philanthropist is, I think mm -hmm. of him. And that was his motivation. It had nothing. And it was a faith-based motivation that he had. I should have known that. When we talked about motivations yesterday, we need to understand motivations of our donors. If I'm building a new library and I find out that the donor says, you know what, I want to memorialize my family on this new library. What am I going to bring to the presentation? Naming opportunities. I'm going to bring the drawings of this new library, the Julia Patrick building of library sciences. If that's what they want, then we must yeah. tailor that presentation to that. Yeah, I love that. And I thank you for sharing that story because, um, wow, it, it's nothing that I would have expected to hear. And part of that, it goes to our fail number seven, because you went, and, and let's tear, carry that trajectory of that donor that you worked with, you went from a hundred thousand dollars, which is a heck of a lot of money, was. bumped it up to a million dollars. And if you had failed to ask, you would have never gotten that gift. That's right. So talk to us about that because to me, that was like a pretty frightening thing to yeah. go to jump up to. Well, I, you know, it's not only uh, a failure to ask on the part of, you know, people say, oh, my board members don't want to ask or my volunteers don't want to ask. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of fundraisers don't like to ask. They're afraid of the ask. And here's the thing, that donor that I sat down with and asked for a million dollars, he's not a mind reader. <laughs> he can't read my mind. Our donors cannot read our mind. We must ask them. We must ask them. They don't know what you want or need until you tell them. And here is the, the most important thing. Uh, you can ask in person. You could ask on the phone. You could ask over lunch, over dinner, coffee, but you still need to ask. And I, I in my own small giving that I do, sometimes I work with organizations and they do everything else right. Perfect. Cultivation is so good. They invite 
people to come and see their facility. They have these special events, meet the clients or whatever it is. Or if it's an education program, we're going to graduate our, our class of immigrants who are going to become American citizens, whatever it is. But they neglect that last part of it, which is to ask. When you don't ask, this is my theory. I mean, and I could be wrong about this, Julia, but I really like to hear what you think. We've got to stop treating our donors as if they're ATM machines. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to say to them, please give us a gift. They're right. not ATM. They're not going to automatically send you a gift. It mm -hmm. just doesn't happen. You have to ask. Well, and I think that you have to ask because um, it's also something that is not a natural thing, right? You know, when we go to our local supermarket, um, we are generally in control of what we want to buy. Nobody asks us if we want to buy the lamb today or the beef or the chicken, right? Right. We kind of navigate our own way. But if you if you look at certain types of sales, and I'll go back to the supermarket, when there are the people in there doing the demonstrations, they are successful because they're asking people to try their product. Okay. to you know to do something and you build engagement and you have said from day one when i first met you it's all about the relationship really and so is. you know getting to be a part of that but i i do think the fear factor is huge and it's tragic because um it is it it negates the whole path and it makes it so stressful i think that's right. why we burn out and our development teams and you know. what I like to say to students, and I mean, and Julia, in your own career, I always think of asking for a big gift, any size gift is an honor. Yeah. You are inviting that person to share your organization's values, mm -hmm. to share the mission, to become an investor at whatever level the gift is, to become an investor, to join with you in solving some community problem. That's an honor. It's an honor for me to be the asker and it's an honor for them because I say to them, by asking them for a gift, I'm saying to them, this is such an important thing in your life and in our li my life and in our community's life. Join with us, let's get this done. Mm -hmm. No yeah. one has ever, I mean in your career, no one has ever said, Jack, how dare you ask me for a gift or get out of here right now? Yeah. How could you, you scoundrel or call me names <laughs> or, or cursed me out or done anything? No one's ever done that to me. So don't be afraid to ask guys. Yes. And I think to kind of go back to the fundraising uh, cost selling model, if you are following that path, which is a circle, um, right. you're not just showing up asking people for money. That's kind of like at the tail end. You have mm -hmm. done all these steps That's right. and built a relationship and 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 had discussions and um you know you're 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 kind of well on the way to yeah. what that looks like. And so I think that's one of those things. And and before we go on, I think a lot of board members don't get that. I think it is like a dialing for dollars. Who do you know? Just ask. They yeah. don't understand that truly sustainable um and structural development is a pattern and it is right. a process. It's not just dialing for dollars. So. Remember what we talked about yesterday, and I know people can go back and watch that if they haven't seen it, is, is that we said uh, people give because someone asked them. Yeah. 85% of all the donors in the world in the survey said, I gave a gift because someone asked me. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a huge thing. And it's, it's such a, um, a, such a psychological issue and so I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by that. And I, I probably will be to my last breath. Um, fundraising fail number eight, not understanding the importance of stewardship. Talk to us about that, because I think it seems like a lot of us are like, OK, we got the gift. Whew, go on to the next thing. But yeah. you're saying step back and, yeah. and talk to us about this. Yeah. I mean, so you got past the fear. You made the ask. You got a gift. Now it's not over. Mm -hmm. It's in, in fact, the whole cycle is still going on. And stewardship is such an important part of that fundraising cost selling cycle that we talk about. Mm -hmm. This is where you show your donors the impact of their gift. I said in solicitation, 
join with us. Let's work together. Let's solve this problem in the community. Now in stewardship, you've made, they've made the gift to your organization. Let's show them what you did with that gift. Here's the thing. There's some general rules. These are no-brainer rules about uh, stewardship. Personalize the thank you. If you send a, a dear friend letter as a thank you, it's going to fail. Remember that stewardship is a powerful, powerful thing in getting the next gift. It's sort of a cultivation of event. I, I equate stewardship with cultivation. You're that thank you is cultivating them for the next ask. And donors need to feel valued. They need to feel uh, listened to. They're, they want to hear about the impact of their gift. They want to know that you're not wasting their money or their time. Recognition should be commiserate with the gift. I see in my study group yesterday, I saw a, a email chain, people were saying, can anyone share a stewardship plan with us? And I agree, you need a stewardship plan. If I gave $100, then I have a certain expectation about stewardship. Mm -hmm. If I gave $100,000 or a million dollars, my expectations about stewardship are going to be much greater. Mm -hmm. And I think I love the idea of a stewardship plan based upon the giving level. I think it's really important if when you do that stewardship, you're creating a um, an impression on the part of your donors that they're valued. You know, you've probably heard of buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. And we talk about this in constantly. There is some donor's remorse, especially in, in a major gift or a transformational gift. And you know how you overcome that? By excellent stewardship. You know, Jack, it's interesting because um, I get the sense, and I'd love your, your feedback on this. I get the sense that stewardship is more of like a personal thing, depending upon the development officer, and that there aren't organizations that have a strong enough plan, as you just mentioned. And so it tends to be a little willy nilly. I mean, no. do you see that or is that just. Oh, yeah, I do see yeah. it. Listen, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I've told you the story, Julia, but one of my favorite professors in college died mm. and his wife said he loved to hike. Please make a gift in his memory to this organization. I did. It wasn't a big gift. It was a small gift. Yeah. But I never received a thank you note from the organization. What I did receive is a request for a second gift. And guess what happened? I didn't make a second gift. No. no. Because I don't know what they did with the first gift. I don't even think, I, I know they cashed the check, but <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Big mistake. Big yeah. mistake. Big mistake. And, and, you know, we talk about donor retention. You and I have had this conversation, Julia. Donor retention is so low in the, in the States. Part of the problem is a failure in stewardship. Right. How, before we move on, how do, I mean, we test, test, test so much in our marketing and our communications. And I mean, it's like consumer testing and we're always a part of this. How do we as an organization look at our stewardship? Should we be testing that? Should we be doing, sure. you know, uh, you know, listening sessions to find out what is meaningful? Oh, um, because I love it, it seems like it's varied. I mean, nobody is doing the same thing. Maybe that's good. Maybe, you know, that we have different ways of, of working with our donors, but. Yeah. yeah. I mean, part of, part of understanding, you know, when we talk about need discovery in the cost selling cycle, we mm -hmm. ha have this questioning strategy. We mm -hmm. ask them before we even ask them for a gift. Typically when you make a gift to an organization, how do you like to be recognized? That was the failure I did it with that donor. Yeah. If I had asked him before I sat down and asked him for the million dollars, he may have said, never put our name on anything. We don't want to be recognized in that way. That's back to understanding to tailor your presentation, to tailor your solicitation. The mm -hmm. whole works that we do in cause selling is mm -hmm. to, to be such a donor centric person as it relates to that. Mm -hmm. I love this. And I, I appreciate you spending more time on that with us because um, this next piece is 
something that, you know, between you and I, we haven't really talked about this. We've gone around the edges until very recently with Angela Barnes. And, mm -hmm. and this concept is huge. And it's the fail number nine, not having a framework for ethical fundraising. Yeah. What does that look like? Because that's so, a big concept. It, it sure is. And, you know, you and I talked with Wendy yesterday about this responsibility we have. We meet with donors. They tell us about their family. They tell us about their finances. They tell us about their ambitions, their dreams, what they want to see happen in the community. They tell us the most personal, intimate things about themselves. We must demonstrate and practice accountability and respect for those donors and prospects through every single part of their journey through our organization. AFP has a code of ethics. There are so many out there. Association of Healthcare Philanthropy, CASE. I mean, you, the, pros, the Organization of Prospect Research, they all have codes of ethics and we must honor those. We must understand them and we must bring them to every single aspect of the work we do with donors. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's something that we need to be discussing up front before we have problems because it yeah. seems like it only gets addressed when there's an issue and then it just cripples an organization and a team. Um, so huge. And, and I appreciate you really bringing that up. I really do. Transparency. Transparency is the foundation of trust. Mm -hmm. We should be transparent. We should publish our annual report on our website, publish our tax return on our, on our website. We should talk about not only the successes of our organization, but our challenges. Our donors are waiting to hear what's stopping us, what's challenging us from advancing our mission. I love Let's it. Tell them. Let's yeah, bring them in. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like we're today, you know, talking about fail fails um, so that we can move forward and we can learn. Okay, this last one's a doozy. And in in some ways, I you you mentioned when we were corresponding, maybe this should be the first one, but I love ending on this because yeah. in essence, you're saying a failure to develop your own theory of fundraising, meaning You've got to take all this amazing information, but at the end of the day, make it your own. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, here's the thing. So I think it's important and it's, it's not, this is not my idea. I, I mean, we've seen this, I've read this and I, I there's, there's a specific thing without our own personal theory of fundraising, we are just employees of a nonprofit organization working in fundraising. I think it's important for us, and I'm going to ask you a question before the end of this. I think it's important for us as fundraisers to examine our own values, mm -hmm. our own vision, our own personal mission mm -hmm. as foundational for our ability to, to engage in fundraising. How do we know our values? We know our values drive us to make a world a better place. Here's the thing. When I was a child, and I want you to think back, Julia, when you were a child, my mother was my role model for philanthropy. Mm -hmm. She wasn't, I don't ever remember her making gifts to any nonprofit. But every once in a while, someone, a woman, I remember it was an older woman would come, she'd knock on the door and she would have a bag and she would say, Do you, can you spare any food? And my mother would immediately go to her kitchen cabinets where she had her canned goods and she would get a can or two and she'd go outside and she'd give it to that woman. Mm -hmm. What she was doing was demonstrating to me and my siblings, our, she was creating in us a theory of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think if if we engage in thinking of our experience with watching that, her modeling that, mm -hmm. when I come out of the supermarket and there's a kettle and I drop some change there, yeah. I am mirroring my mother's yeah. 
example of philanthropy. Think back in your own childhood, oh, you yeah. know, with your own parents. The other part of that, which I think is really important, is our experience with receiving gifts. Have mm -hmm. we ever been the recipient of charity? Yes, we have. In this sense that, you know, maybe I got a scholar, a scholarship to college that mm -hmm. someone else, that's my experience. Or, you know, my dad was on a striker. He was on strike for his union, got some extra additional food in the household. We need to think about that. We need to lead ourselves through the journey and develop our own theory of fundraising. What I'll say as the final thing, there's a blog at my learning portal that I wrote about my own theory of philanthropy. Awesome. my own journey to where I am today. Take a look at that, guys. Awesome. I love that. Well, and I know, Jack, in my own life, it is a heck of a lot easier to ask for money for an organization if you believe in the cause. If you really believe that this is serious and we need to be, you know, navigating this crisis or this issue, it's super easy. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't have that sense of like, this is not really that important or I'm just doing a job. It comes across. But when you are passionate and you really believe it, er it erodes fear, it builds confidence. It really is more meaningful. Um, yeah. it, it just is a, a, it changes the whole picture. So I love that we ended with this today because it's really, I think it, in many ways, it's one of the most powerful messages and um, I will go on to the Fundraising Academy website and, and read that because that would be super, super cool. Jack Galato, CFRE, Fundraising Academy trainer extraordinaire from National University. It's always a pleasure, my friend, to learn from you and to, uh, I'm always emboldened by what you say and how you say it, and it just brings it all together. 10 epic fundraising fails. We've done this over two days. It's one of our two-day drill downs. It has been a really exciting thing, Jack. Uh, for those of you lucky enough to have gotten a ticket to Cultivate, which will be going on next week, you'll get to meet Jack Alato in person. But that event has sold out. And so I know there's a waiting list, but um, you'll have to kind of wait for another opportunity or see Jack when he comes back on the nonprofit show. Again, thank you to our amazing sponsors who allow us to have these incredible conversations. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, where Jack comes to us from. JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, really for some amazing conversations. And, and this two-day drill down with you, Jack, has been riveting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank fun. you. Thank yeah. you, Julia. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. And I think the lesson here for me, and I, I'll just talk about this quickly before we sign off today, is that, you know, there's no such thing as a fail if you don't learn from it. That's right. That's right. You know? Yep. Um, I like the word yet. You just haven't done it right yet. Yet. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to I'm gonna write that down and put that on a sticky note on my desk. That's fabulous. Well, hey, everybody. We like to end every episode of the nonprofit show with this message. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Jack Lotto, you're my hero.